the preface of heart talks on holiness this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org heart talks on holiness by samuel logan brengel preface this book is a welcome successor to the writer's former volume on the same subject which was entitled helps to holiness the aim of both is intensely practical the former has won for itself a permanent place in the literature of this great subject and i have little doubt but that the present work will prove equally useful to the plain people for whom it is written pilgrims soldiers of christ who are seeking how they may order their lives and train their hearts in holiness and righteousness before him i have said that the aim of these papers is a practical one nothing would i am convinced be more unsatisfactory to the author a gifted officer of the salvation army than that the perusal of what he has written here should result merely in a better understanding of the theory of salvation even in increased knowledge of the will of god he has aimed at something more than this to help men and women to enjoy that salvation and to enjoy it now and to lead every reader to do that will and do it all the time the glorious experience here described and enforced is the true secret to a life of happiness and usefulness on earth as it is the highest preparation for the life and service of heaven that experience is for you bramwell booth end of preface Chapter One of Heart Talks on Holiness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Heart Talks on Holiness by Samuel Logan Bringle. Death of the Old Man. The Son of God came into this world, and lived, and toiled, and taught, and suffered, and died, and rose again, in order to accomplish a twofold purpose. The Apostle John explains this twofold work. In 1 John 3, 5, speaking of Jesus, he says, Ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. This is his justification and regeneration, which are done for us and in us. In verse 8, he adds, for this purpose the Son of God was manifested, to destroy the works of the devil. That is entire sanctification, which is a work done in us. Now, upon an examination of experience in Scripture, we find this is exactly what man needs to have done for him. First, he needs to get rid of his own sins, and have a new principle of life planted in him. All men have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And when any man comes to God, he comes burdened with a sense of his own wrongdoings and tempers. His sins condemn him. But thank God Jesus came to take away our sins. When a man comes with a penitent heart, acknowledging himself a sinner, and puts his trust in Jesus, he will find himself suddenly freed from his sins. The sense of guilt will vanish. The power of evil will be broken. The burden will roll away. Peace will fill his heart. He will see that his sins were laid on another, even on Jesus, and he will realize that with his stripes we are healed. This is a result of that free pardon, that free justification for all past offenses that God gives to everyone who surrenders himself heartily to and trusts in Jesus. At the same time, God plants in the man's heart a new life. The man is born of God and receives what Paul calls the washing of regeneration, which washes away all the man's guilt, and all the sin for which he is responsible. At this time, too, there will be planted in the man's heart love, joy, peace, and the various fruits of the Spirit. And if his experience is very marked, as such experiences frequently are, he will probably think there is nothing more to be done. But if he walks in humbleness of mind, which, by the way, is a much-neglected fruit of the Spirit, if he speaks often and freely with those 
who love the Lord, and if he carefully searches the word of God and meditates therein day and night, he will soon find that sin's disease is deeper and more deadly than he thought, and that behind and below his own sins are the works of the devil that must also be destroyed before the work of grace in his soul can be complete. He will find a big dark something in him that wants to get mad when things are against him, something which will not be patient, something that is touchy and sensitive, something that wants to grumble and find fault, something that is proud and shuns the shame of the cross, something that sometimes suggests hard thoughts against God, something that is self-willed and ugly and sinful. He hates this something in him and wants to get rid of it, and probably condemns himself for it, and maybe will feel that he is a greater sinner now than he ever was before he was converted. But he is not. In fact, he is not a sinner at all, so long as he resists this something in himself. Now what is the trouble with the man? What is the name of this troublesome something? Paul calls it by several names. In the eighth chapter of Romans, he calls it the carnal mind, and he says it is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. You cannot fix it up. You cannot whitewash it over. You cannot make it better by culture or growth, or by any effort whatever. It is an enemy of God, and cannot be anything else. In the seventh chapter, he calls it the body of this death, and wonders how he can get deliverance from it. In Ephesians 4.22, and in Colossians 3.9, he calls it the old man. In Galatians 5.17, he calls it the flesh. James calls it superfluity of naughtiness, which is also well rendered the remainder of iniquity. James 1.21. John calls it sin, as distinct from sins, and the work of the devil. Ezekiel calls it a stony heart, chapter 36.26. The theologians call it inbred sin, original sin, and depravity. Whatever you wish to call it, it is something evil and awful that remains in the heart after a man has been converted. Some say that it is gotten ridden of at conversion, but I never saw any people who found it so, and Mr. Wesley, who was a much wiser man than I am, and who had a far wider range of observation, examined thousands of people on this very point, and he said he never knew of one who got rid of this troublesome thing at conversion. Some people say that growing in grace is the remedy. Some people say you never get rid of it while you live. It will remain in you and war against you till you die. They are not altogether prophets of despair, for they say the new life in you will overcome it and keep it down, but that you will have to stand on guard and watch it, club and repress it, as you would a maniac, till death relieves you. The Catholics have fixed up a doctrine of after-death destruction and purgatory for this old man. Personally, this subject once gave me great concern. These warring opinions perplex me. While the old man made increasing war against all my holy desires and purposes, but while I found man's teachings and theories were perplexing, God's teachings were plain and light as day. 1. God doesn't admit that we get rid of this at conversion, for all his teachings and exhortations concerning it are addressed to Christians and those who hold this doctrine will have to admit one of two things, either that it is not removed at conversion, or that a great number of earnest professors who claim to be converted have never been converted at all. Personally, I cannot admit the latter for an instant. 2. God does, by the mouth of Peter, exhort us to grow in grace, but that simply means to grow in favor with God, by obedience and faith, and does not touch the subject in hand. Corn may grow beautifully and delight the farmer, but all its growth will not rid the field of weeds, and the farmer will have to look to some other method to get rid of those troublesome things. 3. Neither does God anywhere teach that this thing 
need be bothering us till death, or that death will destroy it. 4. Nor do I find any warrant in the whole Bible for purgatorial fires being the deliverer from this evil. 5. But I do find that God teaches very plainly how we are to get rid of it. Paul says, Put off the old man. Ephesians 4.22 James says, Lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. James 1.21 John says, the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. Not part or some sin, but all sin. And again John says, Jesus was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. And God says through Ezekiel, I will take away the stony heart. All these passages teach that we are to get rid of something that bothers us and hinders our spiritual life, and show plainly that this work is not to be a slow evolutionary process but an instantaneous work wrought in the heart of the humble believer by the holy ghost blessed be god and the bible further teaches that the one thing needful on our part to secure this operation of the holy spirit is an obedient faith that laughs at impossibilities and cries it shall be done if this bible teaching is true then it is a matter that can be proven by experience. If one man proves it to be so, that establishes the Bible testimony against all the doubters in the world. All men used to believe the world was flat. Columbus rose up and said it was round, and he proved it against them all. There may be some ignorant old fogies yet who believe the world is flat, but they can prove it to be round. If they will take the trouble, and whether they prove it or not, their pure blind unbelief does not change the fact. Just so the greater part of mankind believe that the old man is destined to live to the end. But as Paul says, their unbelief does not make the faith of God of none effect. And humble men and women are rising up every day to declare it is possible, and that all men can prove that he can be destroyed if they will meet the condition. Oh, that we could get men to understand this. Oh, that we could get them to take counsel with faith and not with unbelief. Oh, that we could get them to see what Jesus really came to do. I proved this fifteen years ago, and ever since I have been walking in a day that has no setting sun, and everlasting joy and gladness have been on my head and in my heart. Glory be to God. It is no little salvation that Jesus Christ came to work out for us. It is a great salvation, and it saves. Hallelujah! It is not a pretense. It is not a make-believe. It is a real salvation from all sin and uncleanness, from all doubt and fear, from all guile and hypocrisy, from all malice and wrath. Bless God! When I begin to consider it and to write about it, I want to fill the pages with praises to God. The hallelujahs of heaven begin to ring all through my soul, and my heart cries out with those four mystical beasts before the throne. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, and in spirit I fall down with the four and twenty elders, and worship him that liveth for ever and ever, who has taken away my sins and destroyed the works of the devil out of my heart, and come to dwell in me. Finally, take heed lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. But we which have believed do enter into rest. Hebrews 3.12.18.19 and four three is it possible for a man to have the blessing of a clean heart and not know exactly when he obtained it answer no if you have a clean heart you must know a time when your whole heart went over to jesus and he so poured his spirit into your heart that from that time you had victory over the carnal mind a man can't have complete victory over the carnal mind and not know it and he will know when this perfect victory through faith in his crucified Lord began. 
in every instance recorded in the bible the blessing came instantaneously and the change was so marked as to be unmistakable jacob wrestled all night for the blessing and would not let god go till he blessed him and said as a prince hast thou power with god and with men and hast prevailed genesis thirty two twenty four to thirty the fiery touch that sanctified isaiah was also unmistakable he cried to god in an agony of conviction for holiness and then relates the glorious experience that followed then flew one of the seraphims unto me having a live coal in his hand and he laid it upon my mouth and said lo this hath touched thy lips and thine iniquity is taken away and thy sins purged isaiah six six and seven all the new testament instances of sanctification as recorded in acts two eight ten and nineteen were so marked as not only to convince the people who received the blessing but also all who saw them that they had received the blessing of holiness end of chapter one chapter two of heart talks on holiness this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott Sparkle, Salt Lake City, Utah. Heart Talks on Holiness by Samuel Logan Bringle. Holiness, what it is not, and what it is. First, holiness is not necessarily a state in which there is perpetual rapturous joy. Isaiah tells us that Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and Paul tells us of himself that he had continual sorrow and great heaviness because of the rejection of Jesus by his kinsmen after the flesh. Joy is the normal state of a holy man, but it may be mingled with sorrow and grief and perplexities and heaviness on account of manifold temptations. The low water mark, however, in the experience of a holy person is one of perfect peace. The high water mark is up in the third heaven somewhere. However, this third heaven experience is not likely to be constantly maintained. Jesus and the disciples had to come down off the Mount of Transfiguration and go to casting out devils, and Paul returned from the third heaven to be buffeted of Satan and stoned and whipped and imprisoned of men. Second, holiness is not a state of freedom from temptation. This is a world of trial and conflict with principalities and powers, darknesses and terrible evils, and the holy soul who is in the forefront of the conflict may expect the fiercest assaults of the devil and the heaviest and most perplexing and prolonged temptations. Our blessed Lord was tried and tempted for forty days and forty nights of the devil, and the servant must not be surprised if he is as his master. Paul tells us that Jesus was tempted in all points as we are and that he is able to succor us when we are tempted. It is no sin to be tempted. In fact, the Apostle James tells us to rejoice when we are subjected to all manner of temptations, for the resulting trial of our faith will produce in us strength and force of holy character, so that we shall be lacking in nothing. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Third, holiness is not a state of freedom from infirmities. It does not produce a perfect head, but rather a perfect heart. The saints have always been compassed about with infirmities that have proved a source of great trial, but when patiently endured for his dear sake, have also proved a source of great blessing. Paul had a thorn in the flesh, an infirmity, a messenger of Satan to buffet him. Possibly it was weak eyes, for he was once stoned and dragged out of the city and left for dead. And in writing to the Galatians, he tells us they would have plucked out their eyes and given them to him had it been possible. Or it may have been a stammering tongue, for he tells us he was accounted rude of speech. Anyway, it was an infirmity which he longed to be rid of, doubtless feeling that it interfered with his usefulness. And three times he prayed to the Lord for deliverance. But instead of getting the prayed-for deliverance, the Lord said to him, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Then Paul cried out, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 
Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. In the epistle to the Hebrews, Paul tells us that Jesus was touched with the feeling of our infirmities. We may be faulty in memory, in judgment and understanding. We may have manifold infirmities of body and mind, but God looks upon the purity of the heart, the singleness of the eye, and the loyalty of our affection. And if he does not find us faulty there, he counts us perfect men. It is not in the mere natural perfection that the power and glory of God are manifested, but rather in goodness and purity and patience and love and meekness and long-suffering, shining forth through infirmities of flesh and imperfections of mind. Fourth, holiness is not a state of freedom from affliction. The saints of all ages have been chosen in the furnace of affliction. Job and Jeremiah and Daniel and Paul and the mighty army of martyrs have and shall come up through great tribulations. It is not God's purpose to take us to heaven on flowery beds of ease, clothe us in purple and fine linen, and keep a sugar plum in our mouths all the time. That would not develop strength of character, nor cultivate simplicity and purity of heart, nor, in that case, could we really know Jesus and the fellowship of his sufferings. It is in the furnace of fire, the lion's den, and the dungeon cell that he most freely reveals himself to his people. Other things being equal, the holy man is less liable to afflictions than the sinner. He does not run into the same excesses that the sinner does. He is free from the pride, the temper, the jealousies, the vaulting ambitions, and selfishness that plunge so many sinners into terrible affliction and ruin. And yet, he must not presume that he will get through the world without heavy trials sore temptations, and afflictions. Job was a perfect man, but he lost all his property and his children, and in a day was made a childless pauper. But he proved his perfection by giving God glory. And when his wife bade him curse God and die, he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hands of God, and shall we not receive evil? And when his three friends were undermining his faith, he looked up from off his ash heap, and out of his awful sorrow and desolation and fierce pain, and cried out, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Joseph is one of the few men of the Bible against whom nothing is recorded, but like Daniel, his very holiness and righteousness led to the terrible trials he endured in Egypt. And so it may be, and is, with the saints today. But while we may be afflicted, yet we can comfort ourselves with David's assurance. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, yet the Lord delivereth him out of them all. A friend of mine said he would rather have a thousand afflictions and be delivered out of them all than have half a dozen and get stuck in the midst of them. Fifth, holiness is not a state in which there is no further development. When the heart is purified, it develops more rapidly than ever before. Spiritual development comes to the revelation of Jesus Christ in the heart, and the holy soul is in a condition to receive such revelations constantly, and since the finite can never exhaust the infinite, these revelations will continue forever and prove an increasing and never-ending source of development. It would be as wise to say that a child afflicted with rickets would grow no more when its blood was purified or that corn would grow no more when the weeds were destroyed, as to say that a soul will cease to grow in grace when it is made holy. Sixth, holiness is not a state from which we cannot fall. Paul tells us that we stand by faith. Romans chapter 11, verses 16 through 22. And he says, Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. It is an unscriptural and dangerous doctrine that there is any state of grace in this world from which we cannot fall. Probation does not end the moment we believe on Jesus, but rather the moment we quit the body. It is only those who endure to the end who shall be saved. Well, here we are in the enemy's country and must watch and pray and daily examine ourselves and keep ourselves in the love of God, lest we fall from his grace and make shipwreck of our faith. But while we may fall, 
thank god it is a state from which we need not fall in fact it is a state which paul calls this grace wherein we stand some have asked the question how can a holy soul be tempted or how can it fall i will ask the question how could the angels fall and how could adam just fresh from the hands of his maker in whose image he was made fall and i will ask the more startling question still how could jesus the blessed incarnate god himself be tempted we have our five senses and various bodily appetites none of which are in themselves sinful but each of which may become an avenue by which the holy soul may be solicited to evil and each of which must be regulated by the word of god and dominated by the love of jesus if we wish to keep a holy heart and stand perfect and complete in all the will of god finally holiness is a state of conformity to the divine nature god is love and there is a sense in which a holy man can be said to be love he is like god not in god's natural perfection of power and wisdom and knowledge and omnipresence but in patience humility self-control purity of heart and love as the drop out of the ocean is like the ocean not in its bigness but in its essence so is the holy soul like god as the branch is like the vine not in its self-sufficiency but in its nature its sap its fruitfulness its beauty so is he that is holy like god this unspeakable blessing is provided for us by our compassionate heavenly father through the shed blood of our lord jesus christ and is received through a complete renunciation of all sin and uttermost consecration to all the known will of god importunate prayer and childlike faith fifteen years ago i obtained this crowning blessing of the gospel through the conscious incoming of the holy spirit when i believed after weeks of earnest seeking and bless god still he abides with me and my peace and joy increase and abound many have been my afflictions and fierce and perplexing and prolonged have been my temptations but with a daredevil faith i have pressed on claiming victory through the blood testifying definitely to what i claimed by faith and proving day by day this grace to be sufficient while the path shines more and more under the perfect day glory be to god for ever does the entirely sanctified soul always walk with the clear light of the spirit in his heart or may he expect seasons of darkness answer he may always have the clear light of the spirit in his heart though perhaps not the same degree of clearness he need not expect seasons of darkness this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that god is light and in him is no darkness at all if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not the truth but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another and the blood of jesus christ his son cleanseth us from all sin first john chapter one five through seven for ye were sometimes darkness but now are ye light in the lord walk as children of the light ephesians chapter five verse eight he that loveth his brother abideth in the light and there is none occasion of stumbling in him first john chapter two verse ten however a sanctified soul may be in great heaviness on account of temptations trials etc wherein ye greatly rejoice though now for a season if need be ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth though it be tried with fire might be found unto praise and honour and glory at the appearing of jesus christ first peter chapter one verses six and seven darkness is caused by sin disobedience unbelief lack of watchfulness and prayerfulness lack of love and charity for others neglect of duty carelessness and trifling it is caused by something for which the sanctified soul is responsible heaviness may be caused by something for which the soul is not responsible perplexities crosses malicious temptations of the devil the sins of others the chastening of god 
as in the case of Joseph, Job, and Paul, with a thorn in his flesh. Sickness and pain may lay the soul open to very painful seasons of heaviness, in which, however, its faith holds fast to the promises. Its loyalty to God is unwavering, and its devotion to its fellow men unquenchable. Paul said of himself, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. The cause of darkness should be sought out and heartily repented of. The cause of heaviness should be patiently borne as a part of God's disciplinary providence. First Peter chapter 1, verse 7. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, neither be thou weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. See also Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. End of chapter 2. Chapter 3 of Heart Talks on Holiness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott Sparkle, Salt Lake City, Utah. Heart Talks on Holiness by Samuel Logan Bringle. Holiness. How to get it. Holiness is that state of our moral and spiritual nature which makes us like Jesus in his moral and spiritual nature. It does not consist in perfection of intellect, though the experience will give much greater clearness to a man's intellect and simplify and energize his mental operations. Nor does it necessarily consist in perfection of conduct, though a holy man seeks with all his heart to make his outward conduct correspond to his inward light and love. But holiness does consist in complete deliverance from the sinful nature, and in the perfection of the spiritual graces of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, truth, meekness, and self-control or temperance. Righteousness is conformity to the divine law, but holiness is conformity to the divine nature. That there is such an experience is revealed to us in three ways. First, by the scriptures. The Bible tells us that God chastens us for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10. And he has given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lusts. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 4 In the Bible, God makes us very precious promises of holiness. He gives us very solemn and imperative commands to be holy. He earnestly exhorts us and graciously encourages us to be holy and teaches us to pray for holiness. Second, that there is such an experience is revealed to us by the testimony of holy men and women who declare that God has brought them into this glorious experience. Third, it is revealed by the hunger and thirst of our own regenerate hearts. For if these desires to be like God and to have his love and holiness so fill our hearts as to cast out every sinful thought and desire are begotten in us by the Spirit of God, then may they well be considered as proof that holiness is possible. For the Spirit of God will not beget desires in the hearts of his trusting children only to mock them. Nearly all Christians expect to be made holy either before they die or at the moment of death, and everybody agrees that we must be holy before we can enter heaven. The Catholics hold that we are made holy in purgatory, that the depravity of our nature is cleansed in purgatorial fires, and through its pains and throes we rise to the vision of God. Some other Christians maintain that we are sanctified at the moment of death by some mysterious operation of the Spirit of God. 
while others again insist that we grow into the experience. But we of the Salvation Army believe that it is the gift of God and is the heritage of every soul that is born again, an inheritance into which we can enter at once by hearty consecration and childlike faith. How then shall this holiness be obtained? Not by purgatorial fires, but by Holy Ghost fire. Not by works. That would make man his own savior and sanctifier. A great trick of the devil is to lead people to think they will get it by doing something. But a man might as well try to lift himself over the fence by his own bootstraps as to transform himself into the divine nature by works. He can get it no more by works than he can change the color of his eyes by works. He can no more rid himself of an inherited temper or get lust out of his heart or hatred or pride by getting baptized by going to church, by joining the army, by putting on the uniform, by reading the Bible, by doing any or every religious work. Then he can get scrofula out of his blood by doing these things, or add one cubit to his stature. It is not of works, lest any man should boast. However, a holy man is abundant in good works, and so is one who is truly seeking the blessing. But more of this further on. Not by growth. Growth adds to us, but takes nothing from us. Neither does it change the nature and disposition. Holiness consists in having something taken from us, and in having our spiritual nature made over into the image of Jesus. In order to be holy, we must have every unclean desire and temper and passion of the soul removed. We must put off the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, as really as a man puts off his old coat and put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, as really as a man puts on his new coat. This is the way God told Paul to tell us to do it. It would be nonsense to talk of growing out of an old coat into a new one. Put off the old coat. Put on a new one. Put off the old Adam. Put on the new Adam. It is not by death. I used to think it was, because I was taught so but I dreaded the thought of being killed by lightning or shot by a stray bullet. I did not want to die suddenly. I wanted time to get ready. But glory to God, I learned that it is not by death. And now I am ready to meet that old enemy. Hallelujah forever. Well, how can you get it? From Jesus, the very same Jesus that saved you and spoke peace to your troubled conscience when you feared you were going to sink into hell the very same Jesus that died for you. But how? By asking, by giving yourself freely and forever to Him, to be not only your Savior, but also your Lord and Master, to do and suffer all His blessed, wise, tender will, by believing and receiving. If you knew you had to die at sunset tonight, what would you do? you would give yourself to God. If you had any grudges against any of your neighbors, you would give them up. And if you had the opportunity, you would ask them to forgive you for hating them, even though they had wronged you or some of your friends. You would not stop to think how they would treat you. You would not care. You would feel it your business to get right, and you would leave them with God. If you had robbed any man, you would try to restore to him what was his, if you had any selfish plans or ambitions, they would sink into molehills before the mighty mountains of eternity, and you would give them up quickly. If you had been unfaithful in the discharge of any duty, you would confess it, mourn over it, and do all in the limited time left you to make the matter right. You would prepare the way of the Lord, and make His paths straight. Then you would throw up your hands in helplessness, and ask God to forgive you, for Jesus' sake and not because there was any merit in yourself. And if you really trusted, you would receive forgiveness and be at peace. You would feel Jesus to be your Savior, and you would rejoice in Him. Now you would be a candidate for holiness. If the Holy Spirit should now reveal to you the hidden corruption of the human heart, and show you that it was out of this bad soil that grew the bad weeds of hatred and pride, selfish ambitions and envy, lies, adulteries, 
murders, drunkenness, thefts, and such like, you would cry to God to rid you not only of the weeds, but to entirely change the condition of your heart, out of which such unholy things grew. And there would be only one way to get this done, and that would be to ask God to do it for Jesus' sake. Trust Him to do it, and wait with full expectation till He did do it. And He would do it. He would purge your heart of all unholy conditions by the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire, as surely as fire purges gold of dross. Glory to God! This is just what He wants to do. He wants all His children to be like His well-beloved Son, Jesus. It was for this that He sent Jesus into the world, and it is for this that He baptizes with the Holy Ghost and fire. Some time ago, a lady came to the penitent form for sanctification in one of my meetings. After I had questioned her and explained the subject as fully as I could to her, and we had prayed, she claimed the blessing, though she did not get any special witness that the work was done. But soon she came again to one of my meetings and testified, and her testimony threw light on the difficulty with many people. She said that for several days after she left that first meeting, she did not feel any different. But while about her housework, a thought came to her mind. No doubt the Holy Spirit, the sanctifier himself, suggested it to her, that her sanctification was a part of her father's will for her, and that he offered it to her on the simple conditions of full consecration and childlike faith in him. Then it dawned upon her, that she had met these conditions, and that now, instead of waiting for any unusual feelings, she must just act as though it were done. She then added that when she began to count it done and to act as though it were done, then she began to realize that God was doing his part. She began to feel the mighty workings of the Spirit in her heart. Now it is, just at this point, that many people fail. They wait for feeling, and hesitate, and doubt, and wonder, and go with their heads down and repine, and maybe throw away their confidence, when they should recklessly but intelligently give themselves over to Jesus to be his forever, to do his will unto death, step out on the promise with humility and adoring faith toward God, and with a shout of defiance to the devil and all their fears, count the work done. One day, ten lepers, poor, miserable men with the flesh rotting off their bones, met Jesus. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, bless him, how he loved them and yearned over them in their misery. But his yearnings over their sick bodies were feeble compared to his mighty yearnings over your diseased soul, my brother, my sister. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourselves unto the priests. It was a law among the Jews that when a leper was healed, he must go to the priest and get a certificate that he was a safe person, to be at large among the people, much as a smallpox patient might have to do among us. But these poor fellows might have objected and said to Jesus, But look at us. We are not healed. Our leprosy is just the same. We are not different since you spoke to us. We shall be fools to go in this plight, and we shall not be received if we do go. Do not mock us. Heal us. Make us feel different, that we may know we are healed. Then we will go. No, no, no. These poor wretches did not talk so. They did not stop to reason with their doubts and fears. They did not stop to examine their feelings, or to compare themselves with the healthy folks about them. Jesus had spoken the word, and it was theirs to trust and obey, and so they hobbled off, I imagine, as fast as they could go. And it came to pass, something always comes to pass when people trust and obey, and it came to pass that, as they went, they were cleansed. Bless God! That was cleansing through the obedience of faith, and it is written for our encouragement and instruction. Reader, 
Do you want this experience? If you have it, rejoice and praise God for it. Don't merely keep on seeking it, else you will get into darkness, but go to thanking God for it and testifying of it to others. But if you have it not, give yourself up fully to God just now. Ask for it. Believe for it. And if it does not come at once, patiently and expectantly wait for it. Expect it. Expect it. Expect it. He gives his people an expected end. Remind God of his promises. Don't give him any rest till he comes and sanctifies you. Tell him you have come to stay and that you will not let him go till he blesses you. Nestle down on his promises close to the loving heart of Jesus and stay there expecting till you know the work is done. If the devil and an evil heart of unbelief say, it is for others, but not for you, you say, I am all the Lord's. Get behind me, Satan, and tell Jesus about it. If the devil says, you don't feel any different, you say, I am all the Lord's. Get behind me, Satan, and tell Jesus about this also. If the devil says, you can't keep it if you do get it, you say, I am all the Lord's. Get behind me, Satan. And don't forget to tell this to Jesus. Acting out your faith, regardless of your feelings, and a heaven of love and joy and peace and patience will soon fill your poor heart. And you will get lost in wonder, love, and praise. Only don't bother yourself about your feelings. Your business is to wait on God for orders and inspiration and then to trust and obey. It is his part of the business to shine upon you and cleanse you and fill you with the Holy Ghost and make your heart bubble over with joy. Claim the promise. Feed on the word of God. Feast yourself on his love and faithfulness in Jesus. Wait on him in believing. Expectant prayer and you shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness and you shall become strong to do a man's work for God and souls. You shall rise above discouragements and difficulties, and you shall chase a thousand of your enemies. And if you can find a fellow with a kindred spirit, the two of you shall put ten thousand to flight. Glory to God! Go to believing just now, and you shall have peace. Continue to believe, and your peace shall flow like a river. Hold on this way, resisting the devil steadfast in the faith, reminding Jesus of his promises, and encouraging your own heart with them, and I declare it will not be long before your patient, expectant faith receives a great reward. God will say, It is enough. He has come to stay. We will bless him. And calling to mind his ancient promise, he will add, Open the windows of heaven and pour him out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Then down into your waiting, trusting, expecting heart will come the Comforter, the blessed Holy Ghost, and up from the deepest center of your soul will spring the artesian well of living waters of holy love and praise. Then the meek and lowly Jesus will come and dwell in your clean heart, and you will love him more than a mother loves her firstborn babe, or than the bridegroom loves his bride. You will adore him, and worship him, and pour out your heart's treasures upon him, and loathe yourself for all your sins that crowned him with thorns and nailed him to the cross, and your unbelief and hardness of heart that kept him from you so long. Have the blessing now. Let God search you and show you all your heart. Don't be afraid. Heartily give yourself to him and trust, expect, ask, wait, receive. Can God deliver a person from irritability instantly, or will the victory come through the process of mortifying your members as Paul advocated, this being a slow cure, but effective? Answer. First, a man may be delivered instantly by the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Second, the mortification Paul speaks of was not 
as our questioner says, a slow cure. It was instantaneous. Paul always advocated an instantaneous putting off of the old man and an instantaneous putting on of the new man. The tenses of the Greek verb prove this. Third, however, a man will never be so saved that he will not have to watch and pray that he enter not into temptation. Satan planted the seeds of sin in the pure heart of Adam, and unless we trust the cleansing blood moment by moment and walk in the Spirit, he will plant seeds of sin in our hearts. We are workers together with God and must work out our salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that it is God that works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. Philippians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Fourth, all stimulants, tobacco, strong drink, even tea and coffee if they affect the nerves, all kinds of food that produce dyspepsia, and all excesses that drain the nervous system should be avoided, lest a certain nervous irritability should lead to sinful irritability. God can teach people the difference. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. End of chapter 3. Chapter 4 of Heart Talks on Holiness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott Sparkle, Salt Lake City, Utah. Heart Talks on Holiness by Samuel Logan Bringle. Hindrances to Holiness. God has provided a salvation for us that is perfect in every particular and that satisfies both the heart and the mind. It makes its possessor more than conqueror over the world, the flesh, and the devil, and enables him to do the will of God on earth as it is done in heaven. It is altogether worthy of its author. It is a great salvation. It is not a mere set of beliefs, nor a poor, pitiful little profession, but a full, joyous, superabounding, all-conquering life. Glory to God. This is the more abundant life. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. John chapter 10, verse 10. Praise the Lord. This life is mine, and has been for fifteen years. And now, for the sake of those who have not obtained this crowning blessing, I wish to point out some of the hindrances to its reception, and the reason why so few comparatively have it. First, many are ignorant of it. Vast multitudes of professing Christians never heard of a second work of the Holy Spirit that purifies the heart and perfects it in love. It is, strange to say, an unpopular theme, and is not much spoken of outside Salvation Army Holiness Meetings. And so God could say today, as he did of old, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 But this ignorance is due not altogether to the fact that it is a subject little spoken about, but also because so few people go to God's word for their standard of life and experience. It is all written out there so plain that a fool need not err, but most professors of religion prefer to take their standard from the people round about them rather than from God's book. Paul says of such folks, they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 12. And they never will be wise. 
unless they cease looking at poor, perishing men and look to Jesus only. Wisdom is from above and must be sought from God himself and from the study of his word and not from the conduct of the people about us. Second, unbelief. Many are familiar with the word of God, but they have not an appropriating faith. They read the exceeding great and precious promises, but it never occurs to them that on the fulfillment of the conditions, they can have and will have the things promised. Paul says of these people, the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2. Instead of crying to God to bring their experience up to the standard of the Bible, they explain the Bible down to the level of their experience, and so never receive the glorious revelation of Jesus to their hearts and the fullness of grace therein promised. Third, some seek the wrong thing. They expect the blessing of full salvation to bring deliverance from temptations, infirmities, natural consequences of broken law, and the like. I once heard an educated minister pray, Lord, save us from our impurities and infirmities. My heart said amen to the first part, but not to the latter. Full salvation delivers always from impurity, but not always from infirmities in this world. God uses our infirmities to bless us. Paul glorified in his infirmities, because through them the power of Christ rested upon him. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. And we read that Jesus was touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. Infirmities and temptations are incorporated by our Heavenly Father into his educational and disciplinary plans for us and are overruled for our highest good and widest usefulness. And we need not expect to be entirely free from them while we are in the body. If we were free from them, we could not enter into the fellowship of the sufferings of Jesus, nor sympathize with our brethren, and that would be an immeasurable loss to us. It is because Jesus was tempted in all points as we are, and was touched with the feeling of our infirmities, that he is able to sympathize with and succor us when we are tempted. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. And it is only as we enter into the common temptations and trials, and are afflicted with the common infirmities of humanity, that we can be touched with tender sympathy for and be largely used in blessing humanity. And so we should not seek for an experience that will save us from these things, but rather should do as we are told, and count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptations. James chapter 1 verse 2 Nor does this experience of full salvation save us from the natural consequences of broken laws. A man may be enjoying the fullness of God's salvation, but if he ignorantly break the laws of finance or health, he may expect to go into bankruptcy or lose his health as surely as the vilest sinner. And this does not argue at all that his heavenly Father is displeased with him morally, or that he has lost any measure of his salvation. Nor does this experience enable us to please everybody and appear perfect to all men. Our hearts may be as pure as the heart of an archangel, and we may love with a perfect love, and yet our conduct may be misjudged, and we be accounted by others as being anything but fully saved. The brethren of Jesus did not believe on him. John chapter 7 verse 5 and his critics called him a glutton and a wine-biber, and his servants shall hardly be above their master, but should rejoice to be as their master. There are two reasons for this. One is that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. Now that is, the love of God in our hearts may be perfect, and his salvation complete. But because of our natural infirmities, we may not be able to fully express in our conduct the holy affections and tender sympathies of our hearts. 
just as clear water in a blue bottle will look blue or in a yellow bottle will look yellow so the pure crystal-like salvation of god in our hearts takes on the color of our earthen vessel the other reason is that just as when you look at a landscape through smoked glasses everything looks smoky so the eyesight of many people is so distorted and blurred by sin by prejudice by unbelief that even if our conduct be perfect they looking at us through the medium of their own sinfulness will criticize us as they criticized our lord before us this being so we need not expect the experience of full salvation to make us appear perfect in the eyes of men but must content ourselves with having a conscience void of offence toward god and toward man and in having his assurance that our ways please him others are seeking a sort of third heaven experience similar to what paul had in which they shall see visions hear voices be visited by angels and constantly have tumultuous and rapturous joy like peter on the mount of transfiguration they say master it is good to be here not knowing that jesus wants to lead them down into the valley to cast out devils far be it from me to discourage any soul from seeking any experience mentioned in the bible has not my own heart almost burst with fullness of joy and love and cannot i in the spirit say with paul have not i seen the lord truly the revelation jesus gave me of himself is unutterable but i got this revelation not by seeking some marvelous experience but by humbling myself to walk with him to wait for his counsel to do his will and to believe what he said then he came to me and took up his abode in my heart he has shown me however that although i am to have his joy holiness does not consist so much in rapturous sublimated experiences as in lowly humble patient trustful love but while some people put the experience up among the clouds others leave it down among the fogs and so fail to get it they think that it consists in simply being free from condemnation forgetting that a justified man is not condemned for instance a man has been condemned about the use of tobacco or a woman about the feathers in her hat each feels that such things are not consistent with a christian life and after a struggle with pride and habit yields and casts away the offending thing of course there is now no longer any condemnation and that soul feels justified but it may not yet be sanctified and it is not unless when the tobacco and feathers went out and off the holy ghost came in destroying every root of bitterness and sin out of the heart holiness is a thing of the heart it is the purging away of the dross of the soul it is the renewing of our whole nature so that we are made partakers of the divine nature it makes the tree good my little eight-year-old boy had the nature of holiness revealed to him by the holy ghost some time ago he professed to get saved and i think he did get saved though he is not so saintly as i feel confident he will yet be one evening not long since however he said to his mother mamma i'm tired of living this way his mamma of course queried why darling what's the matter now i want to be good all the time said george you tell me to go and do things and i go and do them but I feel angry inside. I want to be good all the time. The next morning, as soon as he waked up, he said, Mama, I want you to put that text, Create within me a clean heart, O God, in my textbook. 
and then when he prayed he pleaded the prayer of the royal psalmist search me and know my heart try me and know my ways and see if there be any wicked way in me now holiness makes one good all the time not only in conduct but also in character not only in outward act but also in inward thought and wish and feeling and those who are content with anything below this will miss the blessing fourth another hindrance is the failure to rightly consider the apostle and high priest of our profession christ jesus who was faithful and to appropriate the grace he offers us the other day an earnest christian woman was complaining to me at her breakfast table about her pride and her temper which she had found unconquerable i suggested that she should consider jesus and asked her how she could be proud in the presence of his deep humility and requested her to imagine him the king of kings the lord of life and glory humbling himself and meekly carrying his cross up calvary amid the mocking crowd while she walked by his side or followed his train in pride with high and haughty head she saw the point and while we were at family prayers she said she could never forget that lesson in humility if people would but study the life and spirit of jesus and gladly let his mind be in them the subject of holiness would be greatly simplified paul said let this mind be in you which was also in christ jesus and then he goes on to show us that this mind is one of deepest humility which led jesus to empty himself of his glory and humble himself to die on the cross as the vilest of men and it is this humble self-forgetful loving mind he pleads with us to have holiness is not some lofty experience unattainable except to those who can leap to the stars it is rather a lowly experience which lowly men in the lowly walks of life can share with jesus by letting his mind be in them bless god forever does justification fit people for heaven answer no it gives a title but sanctification gives the fitness this is the belief of every orthodox creed in christendom the only dispute is as to the manner and the time of receiving it the command is follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the lord every honest soul who is justified wants holiness and if he obeys god and walks in the light he'll get it very shortly End of chapter 4。Chapter 5 of Heart Talks on Holiness。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rebecca Glanville. Heart Talks on Holiness by Samuel Logan Brengel. Chapter 5 the outcome of a clean heart. David prayed, Create within me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. He recognised that the blessing of a clean heart would give him wisdom and power and the spirit to teach sinners, and to so teach them that they would be converted. It is the same truth that Jesus expressed when he said, Cast the beam out of thine own eye, then shalt thou see clearly to cast the mote out of thy brother's eye. The beam is inbred sin. The mote is the transgressions that result from inbred sin. The following are some of the results of a clean heart. 1. A clean heart, filled with the Spirit, 
makes a soul winner out of the man who receives the blessing. It was so on the day of Pentecost, when the disciples, having their hearts purified by fire and filled with the Holy Spirit, won three thousand souls to the Lord in one meeting. With the blessing of a clean heart comes a passion of love for Jesus, and with it a passionate desire for the salvation and sanctification of men. It makes apostles, prophets, martyrs, missionaries and fiery-hearted soul winners. It opens wide and clear the channel of communion between God and the soul, so that his power, the power of the Holy Ghost, works through him who has a clean heart, surely convicting and graciously converting and sanctifying souls. 2. The blessing results in a constancy of spirit. The soul finds its perfect balance in God. Fickleness of feeling, uncertainty of temper and waywardness of desire are gone, and the soul is buoyed up by steadiness and certainty. It no longer has to be braced up by vows and pledges and resolutions, but moves forward naturally with quietness and assurance. 3. There is perfect peace. The warring element within is cast out. The fear of backsliding is gone. Self no longer struggles for supremacy. For Jesus has become all and in all, and that the word in Isaiah is fulfilled. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. And the soul is made possessor of the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. It had peace with God, that is, a cessation of rebellion and strife when converted. But now it has the peace of God, as the bay has the fullness of the sea. Anxiety about the future and worry about the present and past go. It took perfect faith to get a clean heart, and perfect faith destroys fret and worry. They cannot abide in the same heart, said a saint. I cannot trust and worry at the same time. John Wesley said, I would as soon swear as fret. 4. Joy is perfected. There may be sorrow and heaviness on account of manifold temptations. There may be great trials and perplexities, but the joy of the Lord, which is his strength, like a great gulf stream flows and throbs through the heart of him who is sanctified in an unbroken current. God becomes his joy. David knew this when he said, Then will I go unto God, my exceeding joy. Probably not all who have the blessing of a clean heart realise this full joy, but they may, if they will take time to commune with God and appropriate the promises to themselves. Jesus said, Ask and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. And John said, These things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. And again Jesus said, I will see you again, and your hearts shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. This joy could not be beaten out of Paul and Silas with many stripes, but bubbled up and overflowed at the midnight hour in the dark dungeon, when their feet were in the stocks and their backs were bruised and torn. It turned Madame Guillaume's cell into a palace and Bedford Jail into an anteroom of Beulah land and heaven, from which the saintly tinker saw the delectable mountains and the citizens of the celestial city. Glory to God! It makes a deathbed soft as downy pillows are. 5. Love is made perfect. To be born of God is to have divine love planted in the heart. Like begets like, and when we are born of God, we are made partakers of his nature. And God is love, but this love is comparatively feeble in the new convert, and there is much remaining corruption in the heart to check and hinder, if not to destroy it. But when the heart is cleansed, all conflicting elements are destroyed and cast out, and the heart is filled with patient, humble, holy, flaming love. Love is made perfect. It flames upwards towards God and spreads abroad toward all men. It abides in the heart not necessarily as a constantly overflowing emotion, but always as an unfailing principle of action which may burst into emotion at any time. It may suffer, being abused and ill-treated, but it is a kind. Others may be promoted and advanced beyond it, but it envieth not. It may be subjected to pressure of all kinds, but it wanteth not itself. It is not rash. It may prosper, but it is not puffed up. Love doth not behave itself unseemly, or, as Mr. Wesley said, is not ill-bred. Love seeketh not her own, is not provoked, thinketh no evil, is not suspicious. 
Love rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. And an evangelist was abused. His enemies were professing Christians, but they backslid. His friends rejoiced, but he grieved. His heart was full of love, and he could not rejoice in the triumph of iniquity even over his enemies. Love beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Love never faileth. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verses 4 to 8. 6. The Bible becomes a new book. It becomes self-interpreting. God is in it speaking to the soul. I do not mean by this that all the types and prophecies are made plain to the unlearned man, but to all that is necessary to salvation he finds and feeds upon in the Bible. He now understands the word of Jesus. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Like Job, he esteems it more than his necessary food, and like David, rejoices in it more than they that find great spoil. Like the blessed man, he meditates therein day and night, that he may observe to do according to all that is written therein, that his profiting may appear to all. 7. It begets the shepherd spirit, and destroys the spirit of lordship over God's heritage. If Peter was the first pope, he was not like many that have followed, for instead of lording it over the flock, he wrote, The elders which are among you I exhort, which am a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for the filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but as examples to the flock. If the cleansed man is a superior, it makes him patient and considerate. If a subordinate, willing and obedient, it is the fruitful root of courtesy, of pity, of compassion and utterly unselfish devotion. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. 8. Temptation is quickly recognised as such and is evilly easily overcome through steadfast faith in Jesus. The holy man takes the shield of faith, and with it quenches all the fiery darts of the enemy. 9. Divine courage possesses the heart. The sanctified man sings with David, I will not fear what man can do unto me, though a host should encamp against me, yet will I not fear. And with Paul, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, for we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. 10. There is a keener sense than ever before of the weaknesses of the flesh, the absolute inability of man to help us, and of our own utter dependence on God for all things. The pure heart sings evermore, The blood, the blood is all my plea. 11. The cleansed man makes a covenant with his eyes, and is careful which way and how he looks. He also remembers the words of Jesus, Take heed how ye hear, and again, Take heed what ye hear. Likewise, he bridles his tongue and seasons his words with salt, not with sugar. Salt is better than sugar for seasoning, but it is only for seasoning. He remembers that, for every idle word that man shall speak, they shall give account in the day of judgment. He does not despise the day of small things, and he can content himself with mean things. Finally, he realises that the common deeds of the common day are ringing bells in the far away, and he lives as seeing him that is invisible, and with glad humility and wholehearted fidelity discharges his duty with an eye single to the glory of God, without any itching desire for the honour that man can give, or other reward than the well done of the Lord. End of chapter 5「Chapter 6 of Heart Talks on Holiness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rebecca Glanville. Heart Talks on Holiness by Samuel Logan Brangle. Chapter 6 – How to Keep a Clean Heart It is possible to lose the blessing of a clean heart – but, thank God, it is also gloriously possible to keep it. 
how to do this is a vital question. Two or three years ago, a brother going to the foreign field arose in one of my meetings and said, I got the blessing three times, but lost it twice. The third time I got it, the Lord taught me how to keep it through this text. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. That is one of the simplest and completest statements of how to keep the blessing that can be given. The conditions of getting it are the conditions of keeping it. Number one, to keep there must be continued joyful and perfect consecration. We have put all on the altar to get it. We must leave all on the altar to keep it. All the tithes must be brought into God's house and we must present our bodies to him as a living sacrifice, recognising ourselves as no longer our own, but his, by the purchase of his blood, and ourselves as stewards only of all that is ours, our health and strength, our time and talent, our money and influence, our body, mind and spirit, all, all are his, to be used for his glory as fully as the fondest bride would use her all in the interest of her husband. And this consecration must keep pace with increasing light. The journey of life is not always through grassy lawns and flowery gardens, but often over burning, shifting, sandy deserts, rocky steeps, fetid swamps and dark and tangled jungles. As the Lord leads the soul in ways it has not known, and, at such times, self-interest may cry out against the sacrifice. But, if the consecration be perfect and grounded in love, there will be no turning back, no plunge into the seductive and easy bypaths, but a steady march forward, if needs be, to Gethsemane's lonely agony, Pilate's judgment hall of shame, and Golgotha's dark and awful hour. But, thank God, it will not be alone, for he says, My presence shall go with thee. Hallelujah. Number two. To keep the blessings, there must be steadfast, childlike faith. It took faith, unmixed with doubt, to grasp the blessing. Unbelief was banished. Doubts were put away. The assurance of God's love in Jesus was heartily believed. His ability and willingness to save now to the uttermost was fully accepted and his word simply trusted when the blessing was received. And, of course, this same faith must be maintained in order to keep it. God cannot require less of the sanctified man to keep the blessing than he did of the unsanctified man to get it. Peter said, We are kept by the power of God through faith. Notice, it is the power of God that keeps us, but it is faith that links us on to the power as the coupler links the car onto the locomotive. Faith is the coupler. Paul said of himself, The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And again he tells us that the Jews were cut off through unbelief and that we stand by faith. We may suffer prolonged trials, great perplexities and fierce temptations. They are part of the discipline of life, but we must... Keep on believing, Jesus is near. Keep on believing, there is nothing to fear. Keep on believing, this is the way. Faith in the night, as well as the day. Number three, to keep the blessings, we must pray to and commune much with the Lord. When we pray, when we talk to God and ask him for things, we commune with him when we are still and listen and let God talk to us and mould us and show us his love and his will and teach us in the way he would have us go. We should pray often, and not be in too great a hurry, but take time to be holy, take time to taste and see that the Lord is good, and to hear what he will say. And this we should do, if possible, in the morning, that we may be strengthened and nourished and gladdened for the day. Backsliding usually begins through neglected or hurried secret prayer. Someone has said, Stay with God in prayer, stay till he melts you, then stay when you are melted and plead with God and he will answer and you will get changed and transformed and renewed and you will do execution. 
Number four, to keep the blessing, we must give diligent attention to the Bible. The soul needs the food of truth, and Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. God commanded Joshua, saying, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. What for? That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, and what shall follow? For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Then thou shalt keep the blessing. David said of his blessed man, His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And Paul tells us that the scriptures are profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And Peter says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby, some professors are smaller ten years after birth than when they were born, because they have not fed on God's word. Mrs. General Booth read the Bible through several times before she was twelve years old, and grew thereby, until it is not to be wondered at that she became a mother of nations. I once gave a talk on the use of the Bible to my soldiers, and some of them caught the inspiration and carried their Bibles in their pockets after that, and spent all the spare time they had in reading and praying, and we could fairly see them grow, until they became powers for God, and some of them are spiritual giants to this day. Number five, to keep the blessing, we must confess it, be aggressive, and seek to get others into it. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The man who withholds his testimony to this grace will lose it. This light, hid under a bushel, will go out. God gives it to us that we may put it on a candlestick and lighten all that are in the house, in the core, in the community, in the nation. Don't limit the power of testimony by unbelief. A torch loses no light and heat by lighting a thousand other torches. Touch a piece of steel with a magnet and it in turn becomes a magnet. It can then be used to turn 10,000 other pieces into magnets with no loss, but rather with increase of power to itself. But hang it up in the idleness and it gradually loses its power. So with us, my comrades, let the Holy Ghost touch us with cleansing power and we become divine magnets and in touching other souls we will quicken them and get added power and clearness of experience to ourselves. But let us withhold our testimony and we lose our power and, like Samson, soon find ourselves as other men. Testify, testify, testify. Clearly, definitely, constantly, courageously, humbly, if you would keep the blessing. When faith is weak and devils all around, definite testimony scatters the devils, strengthens faith and stirs up and brightens the inward witness. Testify to the Lord. Tell him you have the blessing and thank him for it. Testify to your comrades. Testify to your own heart and to the devil. John tells us that the white-robed multitude in heaven overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. So testify if you would overcome and keep the blessing. Number six. To keep the blessing, we must constantly live in the spirit of self-denial. By yielding to fleshly desires, to selfish ambitions, to the spirit of the world, we may lose the labour of years in an instant. The hard hand of the old enemy is ever stretched forth to snatch from us our treasure. We must watch and pray and keep low at Jesus' feet in profoundest humility if we would keep it. It is all summed up in one word. Walk in the spirit, walk in love. Finally, there must be no resting in present attainments. The Lord has clearer revelations of himself for us. We may be filled to the limit of our capacity today, 
but we should ever pray, O Lord, enlarge the vessel, and this we should expect. And, like Paul, forgetting the things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, we should press toward the mark the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, ever remembering that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, not according to some mysterious power to which we are strangers, but according to the power that worketh in us, the power of the Holy Ghost that converted us and made us his dear children. Hallelujah. End of chapter 6. Chapter 7 of Heart Talks on Holiness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Heart Talks on Holiness by Samuel Logan Bringle. Chapter 7 Holiness Before the Flood, or Do You Walk with God? And all the days of Enoch were three hundred sixty and five years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Genesis five, twenty-three and 24 A Remarkable Biography Nowadays men write hundreds of pages about their heroes, and do not say as much as that. But there is a good reason. There is not so much as that to say. Enoch was a mighty man, with a wonderful life, lived under very unfavorable circumstances, and I have profited much by meditating upon his life, and what I think must have been his secret. We are prone to look upon past ages and distant places as peculiarly favorable to godliness. I remember that years ago I thought if I could go to London and listen to Mr. Spurgeon each week, I could be a Christian. And in my boyhood I wished that I had lived in the days of Jesus, and heard his wondrous words, and questioned him about the mysteries of godliness, for then I could certainly have been his true follower. Usually the further back we go, the more godly seems the age, and the more blessed seem the men. But really this is not so, and especially is it not so of Enoch's age and place. The age was most ungodly, and men had very little religious light. The world was fast hastening to that dreadfulness of sin and unbelief which should cause God to sweep away its people by the deluge and leave but eight persons in it. They had no Bible. They had no law. Men had not yet had a divine revelation from heaven, telling them they must worship God, must keep the Sabbath day, must honor their parents, must not kill, commit adultery, steal, lie, or covet. Try to imagine an age and place with no such teaching as that. Every man a law unto himself, his evil passions and lusts and tempers having no restraint put upon them, and he plunging continually deeper and deeper into sin and corruption. Then they had no gospel, with Jesus revealed as a loving Saviour. They had only one promise of hope and mercy, and that rather vague, the one given to the woman after that awful fall in Eden, the promise of the seed that some time should come to bruise the serpent's head. It was a black night, with only one lone, dim star shining in the darkness. But Enoch held on to that promise, and in its light and hope he walked with God for three hundred years. We have a whole Bible, a finished revelation. We have the holy, just, good law of God, showing us what we ought to do and what we ought not to do. We have the gospel, with its full noonday light, showing us how to keep the law how to get life and power to fulfill the will of God on earth as the angels do it in heaven. We have Jesus, crucified before our eyes for our sins, dead, buried, and raised to glorious life again for our justification, and ascended on high to the right hand of God, far above all created things and all opposing powers of evil, to intercede for us, to pour out the Holy Ghost upon us in rich measure, to live in us through the Spirit. We have commandments, precepts, and thousands of promises. Instead of a midnight, with one lone, dim star shining fitfully in the darkness, we have a midday, with all the splendor of the sun in his strength, together with ten thousand reflected lights, shining upon us, 
and yet we, in our trembling, pitiful, shameful unbelief, wonder how ever Enoch could walk with God. 1. I imagine that Enoch made up his mind that it was possible to walk with God, that is, to be agreed with God, to be of the same mind and heart and purpose as God. Of course, there were stupendous difficulties in the way. There was no Salvation Army or churches or Sunday schools. There were no holiness conventions, no days with God and nights of prayer, no Bible, no war cry, no religious papers and libraries. In fact, instead of these helps to walk with God, he found the whole community against him, yea, the whole world, for the Apostle Jude tells us Enoch had to prophesy against the ungodliness he found around him. Then, not only did Enoch have these extraordinary difficulties to face, but he had all the ordinary difficulties as well. He got married, and had a large family of boys and girls to care for. He had all the anxiety of a father to provide for his family, and to protect them from the influences all about them. Then I cannot imagine that he did not have the ordinary infirmities and the sinful nature of other men. No doubt he might have said, as you and I have said, that his temperament was peculiar, and that while others with a happier temperament might be able to walk with God, yet, with his peculiarly crooked and difficult make-up, it was quite out of the question for him to hope to be holy and walk with God. Then, of course, he had the devil to fight. 2. I think that Enoch not only believed in the possibility of walking with God, but he made up his mind that he would walk with God. He put his will into this matter. 3. Not only did Enoch believe in the possibility of walking with God, and determined that as for him he would walk with God, but he took such steps as were necessary to do so. He separated himself in spirit from the ungodly people around him, and he raised his voice against their evil ways, and became not only a negatively righteous man, but a positively holy man. Enoch had his reward. It paid him to walk with God. He loved God, and God loved him, and their affection became so intense that one day God's love overcame the power of gravitation and drew Enoch from earth to heaven, and he never saw death. Now I suppose that most people, in reading the story, think that Enoch's reward consisted in getting to heaven without dying. Well, this was certainly a most unusual and blessed experience, and one, I suppose, that men have wished for all through the ages. There is something about death that is awful, and from which men shrink, and yet, since Jesus has died and gone down into the grave and risen again, the terror is lost to the Christian. Still, it is probable that if allowed to choose, most Christians and all sinners would say, Let us go to heaven like Enoch did. But I cannot consider this Enoch's chief reward, for three hundred years, God was his friend, his counselor, his comforter, his constant companion. Oh, what fellowship was that! What an opportunity to gain wisdom, to build up and round out and ennoble a man's character! How easy to be good and do good! How life must have almost burst with fullness of gladness, walking with God, talking with God, communing with God, having mutual sympathy with God, entering into a union with God as intimate as the union of the bay with the sea, and all this by faith, by simple trust, by childlike confidence. This was Enoch's reward, and it may be yours, my brother, my sister, if you will meet the conditions as Enoch did. End of chapter 7、Chapter、8 of Heart Talks and Holiness This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Heart Talks on Holiness by Samuel Logan Bringle. St. Paul, a Pattern. St. Paul tells us that the Lord Jesus made him a pattern to them which should hereafter believe. 1 Timothy 1.16 this fact makes his life and experience exceptionally interesting and valuable to us and it is an especial mark of our heavenly father's wisdom and love that he has given us such a striking example in every particular of the saving power of jesus as we have in paul people say jesus was divine and so excuse themselves for their unlikeness to him 
but paul was human and if he was like jesus so may we be let us study his experience one his sufferings it is difficult to conceive any form of suffering to which saint paul was not subjected and in every instance the grace of christ was all-sufficient here is a catalogue of his sufferings recorded by himself in labors more abundant if our own general exceeds him in heavy labors it is only because of the improved facilities of later ages for doing more in the same space of time in stripes above measure more than the combined stripes inflicted on all the christians of the present day in prisons more frequent in deaths oft of the jews once i was stoned i was stoned once with a brick and nearly killed but paul received many stones and was dragged out of the city like a beast and left for dead thrice i suffered shipwreck commissioner mcgee suffered shipwreck once and escaped immediately but a night and day i have been in the deep says paul in journeyings often under such disagreeable circumstances as we who live in the days of palace cars and ocean steamers can scarcely imagine in perils of waters in perils of robbers in perils by my own countrymen the jews who hated him bitterly and sought his life in every city in perils by the heathen whom he sought to save through the knowledge of jesus but who clung to their idols in perils in the city by wild mad mobs in perils in the wilderness from ferocious beasts and yet more ferocious men in perils in the sea from drowning and from monsters of the deep in perils among false brethren to whom he would naturally look for help and sympathy in weariness and painfulness and watchings often in hunger and thirst in fastings often in cold and nakedness besides those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily the care of all the churches which were organized from jewish and heathen converts and were bitterly opposed by the idolatrous heathen on the one side and the bigoted jew on the other and which must have been far more difficult to properly organize train and manage than any salvation army corps nor could he look forward to brighter days when circumstances would be more favorable and life more free from pain and care for he says the holy ghost witnesseth in every city saying that bonds and afflictions wait for me two his faith in god and love for man and yet in spite of all these afflictions and physical sufferings and bitter persecutions he maintained a joyful faith in god and a tender self-sacrificing love for all men and when god the holy ghost testifies there shall be no let up in his stupendous trials he cries out but none of these things move me neither count i my life dear unto myself i take pleasure in infirmities in reproaches and necessities in persecution in distresses for christ's sake and in the face of all these things he asks who shall separate us from the love of christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword and though he adds we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter yet in all these things we are far more than conquerors through him that loved us for i am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of god which is in christ jesus our lord and at the last almost in sight of the block and axe where his multitudinous sufferings were to be crowned by a martyr's death he exclaimed i have fought a good fight i have finished my course i have kept the faith and as his faith in his lord was not in the least hindered or destroyed by his sufferings so also was his love for his fellow man untouched by them he says of the jews who were his perpetual and bitter enemies i say the truth in christ i lie not my conscience also bury me witness in the holy ghost that i have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart for i could wish that myself were cursed from christ for my kinsmen according to the flesh who are israelites this is perfect love it is love that suffereth long and is kind 
it is love like that of the lord jesus himself then again in writing to his corps in corinth many of whom seem to have gone wrong and to have made many unjust and contemptuous criticisms of paul himself he says i seek not yours but you and i will very gladly spend and be spent for you though the more abundantly i love you the less i be loved many floods could not quench his love nor drown his faith three the secret the secret of paul's marvellous endurance his quenchless faith and burning love is found in his testimony i was not disobedient to the heavenly vision acts twenty six nineteen away back in the days when he was a persecutor and was scattering the little flock of christ and driving them to death jesus met him met him just as he meets men today showed him a straight gate and a narrow way and paul was not disobedient to the heavenly vision obedience meant social ostracism banishment from home and friends the overturning of all his plans and ambitions a life of toil and shame and suffering the loss of all things and the sacrifice of his life and yet he was not disobedient to the heavenly vision and maintaining this obedient spirit to the end everything else followed the reason why so few have an experience like paul's is because so few count the cost as he did and obey the heavenly vision jesus gives them several years ago a bright young girl of eighteen full of fun and love of society was induced by a friend to enter an army meeting for the first time no sooner had she entered than the faces of the soldiers enchained her eyes and their testimonies went to her heart she sat for a while and jesus came to her not in visible presence or with audible voice but in a spiritual vision she left the meeting convicted of sin on her way home the vision spoke with her you ought to have got saved tonight but i am engaged for that dance next wednesday night you should give up the dance but there are my lovely white dress and slippers i will get saved after the dance but you may die before wednesday night and lose your lovely dress and dance and your soul that was sufficient for this young girl she tore the feathers from her hat and threw them into the fire she rushed upstairs got her lovely white dress cut it up and cast it into the fire the next evening she went to the meeting at last a sister probably discerning in her face the hunger of her heart went to her and asked don't you want to get saved tonight of course i do replied the girl why did you not come to me before and immediately she rushed to the penitent form where in obedience to the heavenly vision she found jesus almighty to save and after four years her face shines with the glory of her lord and her voice rings with triumph as she testifies to the cleansing power of his blood and the sanctifying power of the presence of his holy spirit she was not disobedient to the holy vision a man a millionaire came into a meeting and listened to an army captain and the heavenly vision came to him and he saw the cross and the straight gate and the narrow way and like the rich young man who came to jesus he went away saying if it were not for the red stripes round that fellow's collar i would have gone forward he was disobedient to the heavenly vision sooner or later the heavenly vision comes to all men it comes in the whisperings of conscience in the strivings of the spirit in the calls of duty in the moments of regret for an evil past in moments of tenderness and sorrow in the crises of life in the entreaties of god's people in afflictions and losses in the thunders of the law in fearful ominous threatenings of eternal judgment in the death of loved ones in crushed hopes disappointed plans and thwarted ambitions in all these things jesus hides himself as he hid himself in the burning bush which moses saw on horeb and if men would but turn aside and heed the vision as moses did a voice would speak and cause them to know the lord and if they would not be disobedient to the heavenly vision jesus would turn them back from the pit and satisfy every questioning of their minds and every longing of their hearts god so satisfied the heart and mind of paul some people imagine that paul tells his best religious experience in the seventh chapter of romans when he cries out o wretched man that i am who shall deliver me from the body of this death but the fact is he is here describing his condition under the law 
when as a convicted sinner the law showed him what he ought to do but brought no power to deliver him from his guilty past and the corruptions of his own heart but in the eighth chapter he finds the secret of deliverance from the condemnation of the past and the carnal mind which prevent his doing the will of god on earth as the angels do it in heaven from that point he rises to such marvellous testimonies as i am crucified with christ nevertheless i live yet not i but christ liveth in me and the life which i now live i live by the faith of the son of god who loved me and gave himself for me and through a consecration in which he counted all things lost for christ and a faith by which he reckoned himself dead indeed unto sin but alive unto god through jesus christ our lord he entered into an experience in which one has well said he was free from a repining temper for he had learned in every state therewith to be content he was free from vanity pride and unsanctified ambitions for he glorified only in the cross of christ he was free from every feeling of resentment for he was ready to die an anathema for his enemies he was free from selfishness for he was ready to spend and be spent for those whose love diminished for him a proportion as his love abounded for them he was free from covetousness for he counted all things but dung and dross for christ he was free from unbelief for he knew in whom he had trusted and was persuaded that nothing could separate him from the love of christ he was free from the fear of man for stripes imprisonment and martyrdom had no terrors being ready to be offered up he was free from the love of the world having a desire to depart and to be with christ the absence of these corruptions implied the maturity of the graces of the holy spirit the fullness of love indeed it was that love which constrained him which cast out fear and counteracted every tendency opposed to its hallowing influence what a great salvation was this that paul found through obeying the heavenly vision it is ten million leagues beyond the poor little salvation from wrongdoing which most people seek in order to escape hell it is a salvation not only from sin but from self and a divine union with god and christ so intimate and so sacred that father and mother and wife and brother and sister and child yea and his own life are all shut outside and yet it does not make him nerveless and lead him to sing himself away to everlasting bliss but rather to lavish his love upon all men regardless of their hatred or affection and to pour his life out a sacrifice for the world well might he say follow me as i follow christ and by the grace of god i will follow will you end of chapter eight